Hi everyone, I'm Kay and I'm an A-level music student and today I'm going to be talking to you about Haydn's Symphony 104, Movement 1. This symphony is written in the classical period which is between 1750 and 1830 and this symphony was actually written right in the middle of that, so well not right in the middle but 1795. Haydn was recognised as one of the gr three great composers along with his pals Beethoven and Mozart. Haydn wrote pieces for the Esterhazy family near Vienna um, and he worked for them but when Prince Nikolaus Joseph Esterhazy died, Nikolaus Joseph Esterhazy. Haydn was free to travel wherever he wished so Haydn decided that he would travel to London and this gave him some great inspiration for some of his music due to the musical scene there and the reception that he received. Symphony 104 is part of the 12 London symphonies and it's actually Haydn's final symphony. On a different note, Haydn absolutely loved writing for the strings and he wrote over 70 string quartets. I'm gonna start by going through the whole movement from start to end so you'll probably need a score so that you can follow what I'm saying. Just pause it whenever you need to and annotate. Um, also, as you probably already know, in your exam, you will get a, well, you might get a question that is to do with a certain musical area. So, for example, tonality or instrumentation, sonority, stuff like that. So at the end, I'm going to break down the summary into those sections. So it's really clear. Um, and each section is really clear, so it's really easy for revision. Okay, so movement one is in sonata form. So a typical sonata form consists of an exposition where we have um, the first subject in the tonic key, then we have a transition passage where we go into different keys, and then we have the second subject back in the home key. Quick side note, tonic key and home key are the same thing, they just basically the key of the piece. Okay, in sonata form we then have the development section where we explore new keys, we manipulate the thematic material and really we just develop. The development section usually ends with dominant preparation ready to take us into the capitulation. Well literally everything is in the tonic so the first subject, the transition section and the second subject all in the home key. Then we usually have a coda to round off the piece, which that's in the tonic key obviously, but that is typical of a sonata form. That was typical in the classical period. That might not necessarily have been what Haydn or other composers followed, but that is what was typical. So it's really important to remember that so that when you're thinking, oh, is that typical of a sonata form in the classical period, you know exactly what you're comparing Haydn to. So, the instruments, there are two flutes, two oboes, two clarinets, two bassoons, two horns, two trumpets, 12 first violins, 12 second violins, six violas, four cellos, five double basses and two timpanies. So as you can see, there are so many strings. Um, there are only two on the part for the woodwind, which I actually think is a bit unfair, but never mind. Um, but Haydn really liked writing for the strings, and they'd been around a long time prior to when he was writing, so he really knew how to write well for them. The clarinet writing, on the other hand, is actually really bad. And it makes me really sad, but it is very bad writing because... The clarinet was brand new at this point and Haydn just didn't know its capabilities. And you may be thinking, well, how come Mozart was so good at writing for the clarinet? Well, you're right in thinking that, but Mozart was based in Vienna and Salzburg, so he had probably a lot more opportunities to try out his clarinet writing on people there, whereas Haydn didn't get that. And to be honest, Mozart, this video isn't about you, so... You also may have noticed that the clarinet is an A clarinet, which is different to a B flat clarinet. So any clarinet that you see nowadays, most of them are B flat clarinets. That's the kind of the standard. 
um, but they you do get A clarinets, um, and an A clarinet is used because the key of this piece is D major, and A is the dominant of D, and that makes the writing really nice and easy and under the fingers for the clarinets. So basically, Haydn just made it a whole lot easier for the clarinet the players. Thanks, Haydn. The brass players had no valves at this point, so they were only limited to the notes of the um, harmonic series, which is why um, they are in D, because obviously we're in D major, so it's that's perfect. Um, also, there's a trumpet, there's a trumpet in G, and that is because the second movement is in G major, so it's ready for that. Spoiler alert. So, into the analysis. So, bars 1 to 16 are the introductory bars. This is typical of Haydn to have a slow introduction. It's marked adagio, which means slow. So we begin this piece with a fanfare motif on the tonic and dominant notes played double forte and tutti, meaning all instruments are playing. Um, the tonic and dominant notes are D and A because we're in the key of D major. But hang on, I hear you say, since when was D major written with one flat in the key signature? And never is the answer to that question. That is because the introduction is in the tonic minor of D minor. This was typical of the time to have your slow introduction in the tonic minor. Although the key signature tells us that we're in D minor, it's actually tonally ambiguous because we've got a D and we've got an A, we haven't got the third. So you need the third to tell if it's a major or a minor chord and we don't have that so it's totally ambiguous. The dotted rhythm that we get in the first bar is a baroque feature which is, I'm sure you all know this but anyway I'm going to tell you anyway, that's the period that comes before the classical period and so that's been dragged in um, and it's also a military, quite quite military, quite military, anyway. In bar three a quiet answering phrase is played in the strings and in the first bassoon which is contrasting in dynamic, contrasting in texture, because at the start it was um, monophonic and now it's homophonic. And it's also contrasting in instrumentation, obviously. Um, however, the rhythm does stay the same and we get this dotted rhythm back again. The violin one has a little motif, uh, which has C sharps in, which puts us firmly in D minor, because that is the raised seventh. The effect between the strings and bassoon and the first violin is called call and response um, and to be posh and to funnel. At bar seven, we are in F major. This is because if you look back to bar five, you'll see that we get a change from C sharps to C naturals. And that's the indication that we're going into a different key. So that, that's how we know that we're in, we're in F major and we get a perfect cadence in F major there. So at bar seven, we get this um, opening fanfare motif back again, but now in the different key of F major. Some of you smart cookies might have noticed the relationship between F major and D minor, but in case you didn't, uh, F major is the relative major of D minor. You may have noticed, or you may not have, in which case I'm gonna tell you right now, so it doesn't really matter, um, that the brass don't play here. This is because of that harmonic series that I was talking about earlier, and they can't play the notes F and C. So, it sucks to be that, really. The timpani is also missing because back then you couldn't change the notes on the timpani like you can nowadays. So, any of you percussion players will know that at the bottom of the timpani there's a pedal which you can press down to change the notes. So, you can change the notes of, of a timpani in the middle of a piece, that's fine. But back then you couldn't do that, you just had one timp and that was a D or something like that. So they, like here, they have a timp which is a D timp and so that can't be used. In bars 9 to 11 we have a rising sequence which can be clearly shown in the cello part which um, builds up tension. We get lots of chromatic notes and then boom, back to the opening motif again, the fanfare motif. And all the parts are in again. However, this is cut short um, and it drops to double piano and answers differently because we get a Neapolitan sixth chord um, 
on the final beat of bar 15. So a Neapolitan chord is a chord built up on the flattened second. So in this case we're in D major so the flattened second is E flat so the chord is built up on E flat. I hope that makes sense. So if you look carefully in the bassoon part you will see the E flat in bar 15. Um, however the chord is in first inversion just to make it even more complicated because in the bass part, in the cello part, you can see that we've got a G which is the, I'm trying to think how to say it, second note of the chord. It doesn't really make, it sounds like the second note of the chord should be an F but second note of the chord if you get me. I think I've just made that tenderness more confusing. We then hear the sorrowful music played by the oboe in um, bar 16 and the oboe is used because it is does it is quite a, like a melancholy instrument so it fits perfectly with this little motif but then we have this bar of silence which is because when this was performed it would have been performed in the king's theater where there would have been a huge reverb so like an echo coming back um and that silence gives time for all the sound to disappear then at bar 17 we're into our exposition section so just to remind you of the typical sonata form it consists of an exposition of um, the first subject in the tonic key then we have a transition passage where we go into different keys and then we have the second subject back in the home key. We do start our first subject in D major which is perfect because we wanted to start in our home key, which we have done. It is a 16 bar theme split evenly into eight and eight, which is very typical in the classical period. Everything was made up of fours and eights. The first eight bars end with an imperfect cadence, which forces us to carry on to end with a perfect cadence after the second eight bar phrase. So we have now a few important motifs that are really important to remember because they keep coming back um, all the way throughout the uh, symphony in fact. Um, so they're really important. Motive one is shown in the violin part which is the F sharp G E D. Da, 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 da. And then motive two follows on from that which is the quaver. Da, 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 da. And then motive three comes after which is the ba, da, da, da. so those four minims um, from bars 21 to 22. So there are your three motifs, don't forget them. Thematic, the, theme, the thematic material is mid-range for the instruments in terms of pitch, which is brilliant because it means that it can expand and you can use different octaves and things like that. So that is why it's mid-range at the beginning. 29, we get motive three, but instead of it falling, we get a rising. So that's called inverted. At bar 32, we get a tutti section on the tonic, so we see that the string players do double stopping or even triple stopping and at this point. Also, I know this sounds really silly, but yes, it's only the string players that can do double or triple stopping. It's just the techniques. So I know that there's more instruments that have two notes on a part, but that doesn't mean that um, they're playing two notes at once. Your whole music career hasn't been a lie. Don't worry. It just simply means that they are splitting, so for example the oboe has oboe part one and oboe part two. So the top bit is what the oboe one plays and bottom bit is what oboe two plays. The oboe does not split the notes, although that would be really cool. So. <laughs> it's important to note that at bar 32 the rhythm is the same as motive one. It's not just a coincidence. Note that the harmony in the clarinets and the oboes are written in thirds and sixths, which sounds beautiful. At bar 40, there is a move to B minor, which is the submediant chord, which adds chromatic interest. At bar 43, the flute plays descending crotchets, um, which are a diminution of motive three. So diminution basically means that the notes have diminished in length, therefore they have got smaller. So previously they were minims and now they're crotchets so they've halved their value. However on the contrary at bar 46 we get an augmentation of in the oboe of motive 2. Previously the notes are rising quavers and now they're rising crotchets so here they've doubled in length. At bar 48 we would 
normally expect the first subject to finish and the transition section to start because that first subject has currently been 32 bars long which would be perfect because that divides by eight which is four and that would have been really common in the classical period but no Haydn didn't do that because he's a rebel and he had it for two bars longer so we have a very strange 34 bar I was gonna say 34 bar song but that's musicals that's a whole nother subject but 34 bar subject if you are really confused about how we get into the transition section um just look at bar 52 and all those accentals being thrown in that is a sign that we're in the transition section we get g sharps indicating that we're heading towards a major which is our dominant key um so we get an e dominant pedal and yes i hear you e isn't the dominant of d but it's the dominant of a which we're preparing to go into so this is a dominant preparation pedal remember i told you that that usually happened there we go so at bar 64 we end on a lovely e chord ready to go into a with a perfect cadence for our all for our second subject all a lovely job but no both symphonies give new material for their second subject so now just pause the video and try and look for the new material I actually feel really bad if you did just pause it there because shock horror there is actually no new material because this movement is monothematic which means that subject one and subject two are the same although that's not exactly true because they are in different keys and there are some slight differences so it's important to note the differences in case you get a question about monothematicism because it's quite it's not unique to this symphony but it is it's not common so obviously the biggest difference and we've already mentioned it is the key so previously we were in d major and now we're in a major um the instrumentation as well has changed so firstly we heard the subject in the strings and bassoon and now subject two is in the woodwind provides a change in sonority and sonority is how things sound how the music sounds so it will have a completely different sound now that it's in the woodwind in the second subject we also get an oboe part that wasn't there before in bar 68 the flute player is just told to have just one person playing that so uh, that's different to to before because in subject one all 12 first violins were playing the theme so that's definitely going to lighten up the texture at bar 73 we see some imitation going on between the oboe um, and the violin and the violin two and the cello um, this is counterpoint which we didn't have in the first subject at bar 80 we get an interrupted cadence which provides a harmonic twist we get lots of scalic passages at bar 91 there's a trill on the leading note which is the seventh degree of the scale the dominant which is a typical Haydn feature he always does his little cheeky trills and so our second subject ends at bar 99 with a perfect cadence into A major. We then have a codetta, which is a shortened version of a coda, um, to round off the exposition. We have triadic material in the violin part at around 100 and 101. Um, and the violin two part is in contra motion. So that is quite cool and is also a feature of classical music. At bar 108 we move to the relative minor which is F sharp minor and we move to E major at bar 111. We have to end the coda in A major because at the end of the uh, exposition um, we go right back to the beginning and we repeat it all again and now onto the development section which begins at bar 124. The development section is in the relative minor, which is B minor. Haydn uses a string quartet, classic Haydn. There is a lot of motive two in this section, which is showed um, through sequences and through imitation between different instruments. The call and response is cleverly between high and low pitched instruments, meaning that it's really, really audible uh, for the audience to hear. When there is call and response, you know that the texture is polyphonic. So that's a tip in the development section there's always some 
harmonic interest and this development section is no exception. At bar 145 we go into the key of C sharp minor which is totally unrelated and to be honest it's just a bit weird. At bar 145 there's textual contrast and the violin twos have a oscillating figure. At bar 150 we a circle of fifths which is cool. We go from D sharp to G sharp minor to C major to F sharp minor B major and then E major all in the space of six bars. We get some syncopation at 164 and at bar 172 we welcome back the timpani for literally two bars but they've had to do all that counting so they deserve those two bars. And this is because we have an augmented sixth chord so the timps can play the D in the augmented sixth chord. So we have E sharps here, which is kind of strange, on top of the G in the bass. So that's our augmented sixth chord, which is a strange one. Then we get some pedal at 175. And as we can see, the pedal note is an F sharp, which is preparing us to go back into B minor because F sharp is the dominant of B. There is quite a lot of chromatic well chromatic there's quite a lot of chromatic flavouring um for example at bar 186 in the flute part there's some chromatic parts there as well in the violin one part which makes it a lot more interesting so really the development section just keeps on developing and we get to bar 192 and then we get this silence but you know Haydn really likes that Haydn likes his silences and then boom Back into the recapitulation. The recapitulation starts at bar 193 and bars 193 to 200 are exactly the same as 17 to 24. Same dynamic, same pitch. Then the second eight bar phrase is slightly different because this time it's the woodwind who are playing and so it's a slightly lighter response. I actually think this moment's quite cute because you've got the woodwind trio shoving it in the strings face is like it's not always about you Han. Note that at bar 216 the violin is an octave higher um, than it was before and the brass notes are now minims instead of semi breves. So then at this point in the corresponding section of the exposition we then go into the transition section which started at bar 50 and so currently at this point we would expect the transition passage to run into subject two for the first time in the tonic key. However, this is a bit awkward because Haydn has used monothematicism, so subject one and subject two are the same when we've already heard subject two in the tonic key. So the question here is how can Haydn keep it interesting without just repeating the same old, same old? So you might be thinking, well, why didn't you just end it there? Why do we need to hear subject two again? We've heard it so many times, but that would make the exposition section and the recapitulation section uneven, and we can't have that. So in sonata form, but they have to balance out. So he has to do something different. And his decision was to go into development mode again, and then we have a section where he develops a thematic material. So bars 50 to 64 which were in the exposition section have been taken out and instead we've got this development thing. At bar 22 we get a circle of fifths again which we love and we also get some suspensions in the woodwind which provides beautiful harmonic interest. It's bar 234 you can see that there's loads of rests there and the rests are symbolising Haydn being a bit cautious about repeating and repeating the subject in the tonic key. He's thinking, hmm. The strings at 244 also seem a bit hesitant as well. Some of the strings use pizzicato there um, and that's just a different string technique where you just pluck the string and that is just to change it up, give a different sound. 237, we get the moment that we've all been waiting for subject two in the home key, aka subject one. Haydn puts the oboes in thirds and we get sixths between the violins. At bar 277 we get our coda. 
that rounds off the whole piece and look at that everyone is playing together we get a very full sound lots of scaly passages everything's very energetic it's got a real celebratory feel it's great because then the audience thinks yay we're at the end not knowing that there's three more movements the ending is super grand and as you can expect from a classical piece it's very credential the recapitulation section is not repeated probably because as you can guess we've heard a lot a lot an awful lot of subject one slash subject two slash subject three congratulations you have survived the analysis so now like i said i'm just going to do a really quick summary just breaking it down into different musical areas so that it's super easy to revise so firstly the hard one tonality and harmony if we start with this one it can only get easier the introduction starts with a fanfare motif played on the tonic and dominant notes so despite the key signature telling us that we're in d minor we haven't actually heard the third of the chord so it's totally ambiguous right at the very start in bar three we have an f natural in the bass part and a c sharp in the violin one part both placing us firmly in d minor so we have an introduction in the tonic minor in bar 14 we have the fanfare motif resolving onto the subdominant chord in bar 15 followed by a neapolitan sixth chord the exposition is in d major at bar 40 there is a move to the submedian chord which is b minor with chromatic touches to provide harmonic interest in bar 52 we get g sharps for harmonic interest and this adds to the influence of the E pedal, which acts as a dominant preparation pedal, ready to go into the key of A major for subject two. From bar 73, the harmony becomes a little bit more chromatic. In the codet, we move to F sharp minor, which is very unusual. For the development section, we're in the relative minor of B minor. At bar 150, we get a circle of fifths. From bar 170, the E minor leads us to a augmented sixth chord, which sounds like a dominant seventh chord. The phrase resolves onto an F sharp major chord at bar 174, which, along with the F sharp in the bass, gives us a dominant preparation ready to go back into B minor. Then the recapitulation arrives and we are back in the tonic key of D major. At bar 222, we have a circle of fifths supported by suspensions in the woodwind and decorated by the violin. We have thirds in the oboes at bar 247 and sixths between the violins at 250. The coda is in the home key and we end with five bars of reiterated tonic chord. Next structure it is in sonata form which is very typical for a first movement. We have an intro, exposition, development, recapitulation and a coda. However, Haydn uses monothematicism and so the recapitulation is not repeated like it usually would have been because the audience would have heard subject one in the tonic key too many times. On to texture. The introduction starts in unison so that is monophonic. However, by bar three we hear that the texture has changed to become homophonic with answering phrases. From bar 73, the texture is imitative and polyphonic. In the development section at bar 132, there is some call and response between high and low pitched instruments, making it super audible for the audience to hear. At bar 145, there is a textural contrast and we have an oscillating figure in the violins. Before the recapitulation, we have a pause, um, a silence, and that is very high and ask. In the recapitulation, we would expect the textures to be homophonic, but there are um, some parts which are imitative, so it is polyphonic, which is slightly unusual. For example, bar 254 between the bassoon and violin one. We end movement one in unison, therefore monophonic texture. On to melody. The theme is exposed and subject one is divided equally into two eighths. The thematic material is mid-range, leaving lots of room for expansion later on. We have three different motifs. The second subject isn't the contrasting lyrical theme that we would have expected. It is subject one in the dominant key. This is because it's monothematic. The development section develops and explores the thematic material. There are a few slight changes in the recapitulation melody. The violin melody is an octave higher at bar 216. The brass 
semi-breeves have been shortened to minims at bar 217 and most of the phrases are falling as opposed to rising. We end with many scales which are renowned for sounding like bells ringing, bell is cele very, bleh, very celebratory, so brilliant. On to instrumentation, I've already talked a lot about this at the beginning but Haydn uses the clarinet in A because it fits much better with the key signature. The brass instruments have no valves so they were limited to the notes of the harmonic series. Haydn absolutely loved writing for the strings so there was a lot of string writing. And finally, tempo, rhythm and meter. There is a slow introduction which is very, very typical. The movement is allegro which is also typical. Haydn uses a lot of pauses and a lot of rests just because he feels like it. And that's it, that is everything that in analysis, broken down, I hope it's been helpful to you and yeah, thank you so much for watching absolute best of luck to every single one of you watching this taking a level music i'm sure you will smash it